So, good afternoon to everybody. I hope that you are um, settled and fresh uh, after a very nice lunch that we have here. And I would like to start uh, my presentation by thanking WeWork uh, on the person of Heli here for the very nice invite to be here today. It's a pleasure. Um, and to talk a little bit what uh, I come, the message that I come to bring you today, which is to put ML in production, pardon my French, is a pain in the ass, isn't it? So um, I've been trying to do that uh, for a while, right? I think the first thing, the first attempt um, that I did to do it so was like 13 or 14 years ago, um, where MLOps meant something very different than what it means today. And I still didn't figure, fully figure out how to make that work seamlessly um, at scale um, for this on different companies that I passed by. And so what I uh, discovered that we are constantly trying to catch up and it's like a train that you are always trying to enter, but it's all, always constantly moving. So, um, okay, I start a little bit uh, presenting myself. Ali already talked a lot of things there. Um, I would like to add one fun fact was that uh, some years ago I did the Trans-Siberian uh, Railway. It's an experience that I also recommend to all of you to learn about resilience, which uh, on AI and ML career you certainly will need. It's a quality that you will certainly need. Um, jumping also a little bit about myself, so I studied in the uh, University of Porto, both the Masters and then years later the PhD on ML. And then I've been like a large part of my career in Germany, but in different cities. First in Baden-Württemberg, Heidelberg, uh, then Hamburg, and for the last two years in, in Berlin. Um, and I learned a lot of things in Germany, both uh, professionally and personally, but German was not one of them. So that's also their opportunity for growth. Okay, so, and jumping from a more personal note, to, to the overview of the presentation scope. So this is uh, the image, uh, take one of these trendy, latest trendy blogs about what is MLOps about. Um, and for me, MLOps, uh, it's about making ML work at scale, right? And the, this image you here see like three uh, main buckets, okay? Design, model, model development, and operations. Um, which, in my importance, have equal, if not um, importance, on the success of your ML projects. Some most of the things that I will uh, mention during this talk will be about model development, but implicitly, things like data availability check or uh, ML use case prioritization or best best engineering best in-house engineering practices like CICD and um, monitoring debugging will be in the end of the day key factors to distinguish between success and failure of uh, ML projects in your in your companies okay and jumping uh, straight away to the meat of our presentation, start like with one of the basics that I learned still during my PhD, which data is really everything on your ML projects, okay? So we, the image that you are now uh, watching there, we have two pictures, okay? In the left-hand side, we have here like on the x-axis, you have like the size of a trading set in million, and then on the y-axis, you see accuracy. And then each line is like exactly like the, is a different uh, classifier, different type of algorithm even. So you have instance-based learning, you have a connectionist approach there, you have Bayesian learning approach there. So, and what you can see is like, regardless of the type of classifier you use there, as you increase, the volume of data that you feed, the number of examples that you feed to these models, their performance 
also increase. So the resulting performance, the performance of the resulting models will also increase. Um, and then there will be a difference, of course, um, but the, the models will all, the different algorithms will all reach the models that perform in the same ballpark in terms of accuracy. Okay, so this uh, is to illustrate, again, that data is actually like what, if you don't get data right, you will not get on the same ballpark of accuracy than your competitors. It doesn't matter how much talented is uh, your team or how much well your uh, setup to do experimental log or monitoring uh, you will have. Uh, I mean, you'll always be one step behind or even multiple step behind. In the right hand side is a figure that shows the trend of digital data and digital data growth um, around the world, in particular on the last um, 20 years. And here we can see that we start by digitalizing transactional data, what we call operational data. So I sold this to you, uh, you paid me X, that will be transactional data. But um, as we get to digitalize more and more of our daily lives, we start having human files, human-generated files, being on, on cloud and being used for machine learning uh, 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 use cases, such as photos. Okay. Uh, later on, social interactions. Okay. And there's a little landmark there on 2012. So by 2012, already in every year, the volume of data that was being created was the double of everything that existed in the beginning of that year, okay? This is at the rate, okay, the exponential rate that we are generating digital data. Now, and then lately, like with machines processing this data, communicating with other machines, even uh, process this data through, uh, passing it through models, um, we have uh, the era of IoT where the machines are communicate with other machines generated data that are feeding other machines and so on and so forth. This to tell you what? That is absolutely fundamental that in order to uh, you guys get ahead of these AI rays, okay, you get ahead of the data race. Okay? This is why many of these applications uh, you are bounded to failure or to success depending on the companies where you set for. And here I'm thinking about uh, all the big, big topics like AI democratization, like availability of data, um, how the data is being used. Okay, so GDPR, biases, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go that route now, but um, all these different routes now, but I just want, wanted to stress out that um, data is really key. And it's very important for your project that you start by understanding that, and understanding that even like resorting to business experts, sometimes you look to a data point that you would think that is an outlier, but if you talk to an expert, you discover that it's not and vice versa. So um, this is very important that you also debug it by yourselves, um, but this interaction with business is absolutely crucial to get it right. So input it, version it, treat your data as yet another asset, yet another piece of code, yet another artifact uh, in your project, and test it, right? So it's very important that we ensure that the quality of our data is good, um, so the models are able to model noise, uh, model noise, I'm sorry, to model signal and, and, and not noise. And if you do all of these things well, you are almost there because then you have all the other mountains on the infrastructure to climb uh, in order to, to get your uh, ML model right, which means to monetize the data that you have into automatization of uh, some process on your business. Um, I want to share with you, like in this one, an anecdote from um, something that I had like on a company that was working on FinTech that I was working some years ago, where there was a feature, it was very simple, it was a feature that was being mapped as null instead of NA when it was missing, okay? So this happened somewhere in the messaging service, somewhere in Kafka, somewhere passing, passing these, these were helping. So, um, this turned then when was received 
by by the way for, by the model uh, was being passed not as a missing value but as a zero instead. Okay, this model was two hours in production, and basically that cost the company of two hundred k. Okay, those two hours. It's just an NA mistaken by a no. Okay, it's just that. Um, Another thing, like for more recent, from these uh, these uh, ventures that I uh, with, that I just started with Sender some months ago, uh, when we were using data from a backend database, um, where to to build to build some labels, okay, to some 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 use case of ours, um, and these data we were using were prices, okay, the sell prices of loads uh, uh, to carriers. Um, however, many of these prices were well, actually not the end prices that uh, we end up charging uh, in this case to uh, or paying to our carriers because we got to know that these prices were in practice being circumvented by some of our operators um, and the real price was actually being stored on Salesforce. Um, so train a model over these was actually not not such a great idea. So again, like uh, here, it's important to understand the data lineage. It's important to understand how your business works, uh, and it's important to understand that even a small um, engineering, let's say, typo, um, can affect greatly um, the, your ability to uh, to put uh, model successfully in production to monetize on the data that you have. So on this slide, don't worry, the picture was not gone. It's proposedly in blank. Okay, so it says, if you can, don't use ML. Okay, so I'll start to make the point here. I'll start by asking all of you, so whoever has used or deployed a machine learning model in production. Okay, most of the room did. Who down the line, let's say six, 12, 18 months down the line, has regretted of using ML for that use case? Nobody? Okay, you guys are lucky. So that happened to me like several parts. Yeah. Sorry? Ah, okay, 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 good, <laughs> good, 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 good to know that. So wait for it, wait for it. So the thing is, like most ML based products are complex. Uh, level on a mix of different ML models with business heuristics in order to work. And as they are complex, they add a lot of tech debt, eh? so, which will involve additional costs, probably not only in resources, um, but also humans to maintain it, and also SaaS. Okay? Uh, if you don't plan to scale your product massively, or if you believe you don't have enough data still to go for a model, don't go there. Okay, you are just hindering your ability to monetize on that data, um, and yeah, it's really something that uh, I don't go there just to go for the hype. That will give you um, more headaches later on than, than than nice things to put on your CV. Let's say this way. Um, the the thing is like even if you do it so. Uh, you have to think that ML models, as they, they will take decisions or rec make recommendations or not take decisions or even take decisions on themselves, they will inherently, even if they work well, they will inherently introduce a bias in your business will, which will affect the acquisition of your data, which down the line will affect your ability to keep creating models and work, which is a bit like ML hurts ML type of thing, which is a bit like Inception. I don't know if you, saw, uh, if you saw the movie, but uh, it reminds me so. Um, and if we're here, I'll give you an example also from yet another FinTech that I was working here more recently, like uh, two years ago, where basically um, by, imagine like this is what we're talking about on financial sector and lending business. So. You typically will have a model that you want to distinguish between good and bad customers. Customers that are willing to repay you a loan and customers that are not willing to repay that loan. But that model will be trained based on observed data, observed repayment data, 
uh, that you somehow, so here, if you issued a loan to these customers, so these customers are already like assumed somehow to be good. So the model is not being trained to distinguish good from bad customers. It starts to be trained to distinguish good customers from not so good customers. And if this model that we deploy again is successful, so your customers will even get better. Okay, so we'll make less mistakes. So we'll accept more customers with good repayment behavior and reject more customers with uh, theoretically bad uh, uh, repayment behavior. So uh, again, you inherently will be collecting less data that's less representative from, from, from the reality and this bias keep going on. So again, um, if you don't have like a setup that is convincingly being able to handle with this, and this happens when you have some scale. Um, it perhaps is, even on this case, even if you have the data, even if a model looks right, it perhaps is not the best idea in the world to have an ML model doing that for you, okay, in early stage. So it's really like the message that I want to pass here today is like, be aware of the benefit of uh, using ML in production, but be, also be aware of the, the drawbacks. And if you can avoid it, please do it so. Um, again, strong words. I think uh, uh, ML, ML lovers will uh, hate me and throw tomatoes and eggs after this presentation. So I say here, uh, all ML models are terrible and some are useful. So what are ML models, right? They are mathematical approximations of the reality. But it's just approximations, right? So, so they don't really map the nature of things one-to-one -one in perfection, OK? And typically, power algorithms end up picking up the signal in the data, but also the noise in the data. They pick up everything, okay? They're like those, those vacuum cleaners that are from the floor, that's very smart, but they really pick up everything. And they are designed, they are designed to overfit. And simply when they think about uh, uh, deep learning approaches, that, that's uh, typically you have overfitting by design unless you do uh, something to, to fight it. Um, and in the end, this is not about to beat some metric, some model on some metric on the test set. This is about moving the needle on uh, your company's bottom line. So please make sure that, that you are using the right tool to the right, um, to the right problem. Here, I'll give you like uh, um, an example again from, uh, in this case also again from, from a FinTech that I work in the past, where there was a feature that was picked up by the model, which was like a phone number or derived from a phone number, let's put things this way. Um, and this was not one of the top features, it was a feature that was uh, somewhere top 50 in the model. Um, so it didn't attract attention. So, but what actually was doing, what happening in the, the, behind the scenes was the following. So customers that ever called to customer center had their phone number updated with the indicative of the country, while all the other customers had just like the plain phone number there. Um, if a customer, if you think about lending business, is calling back to the customer center, probably to reply to some email, this is a good customer. This is a customer that is willing to contact with you. This is a customer that is willing to, probably is willing to repay. And the model pick up on that. So basically, if the phone number <laughs> is starting by a plus, this is a good customer. There were, there were not so many cases in the trading set of this sort then this signal was mixed with other signals that the model was uh, picking up by. But once it did production, and in production, basically, all the phone numbers now were coming with an indicative. My ba the battery of my phone died. Okay? No, they didn't fire me. At least not on that day, but that's, that's for another story. Okay, so, but uh, this is... Uh, for you to understand that uh, this was a good model, okay, that was retrained by, uh, without this feature, that was worked perfectly fine for months. So, but uh, it's for, 
it's very easy for you to understand that something, something, these models like are typically things very fragile, okay, and very short lived. And you have to understand that some are useful. A good example uh, for this is then, for this, every time you are uh, using Google, okay, for a search, um, that your search query passes for, I don't know, 20 different systems before you get uh, a result. And one of these systems, uh, or several of these systems, they use a final approach, will be to rank down the zillions of possibilities that they have in pages to match to you into something uh, computationally more uh, affordable. And here, uh, this approach will be most likely a very simple machine learning algorithm, okay, that will be in place. Not to rank, to make the perfect ranking, but just to make a separation between what's something that can be remotely relevant to, to this fellow to something that will not. Yeah. So again, it's about usefulness and know how, where to use um, and how to use the tools and where to use them versus where not to use them, okay, and know how to use them in order to monetize your business, to increase your business bottom line. Um, theory does not apply even if science does. So I have this image here from uh, uh, Albert Einstein that in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they are not. Um, and basically, there are a lot, it is to say what? There are a lot of assumptions. So this, this, this ML model that you guys are using now, or algorithm, sorry, that you guys are using now in these Python packages. So they are typically uh, starts being developed on universities. Then someone makes a package out there. Then there is a community that starts contributing to make these packages more reliable and so on and so forth. But they are built what I call in vitro. Okay, they are built based on mathematical assumptions and statistical assumptions such as gestionality, such as IID, which are things that in practice never hold. Okay, so, so they, they, it's, like, it's like you assume something that will never occur and then we are to build something that you are using every day. Okay, so, um, that, so this inherently means that your models will fail. Perhaps they don't fail on the day you deploy them, but they will fail one week later, two weeks later, six months later, right? Okay. Maybe eight, that your model will fail because they are designed to fail, okay? So um, that is as sure as the globe will continue to spin. Um, so instead of um, using theory to make big claims like, okay, now we'll lose deep learning on everything on the company or like for everything will be like just one model. So. Or, Let's follow the latest uh, uh, flashy trends. Make sure that you use theory rather to prioritize the hypotheses that you have, either to create new model or to improve an existing one. Um, there are ideas that by design, they have way less chance to work, okay, than others. I'll give you an example. So if you think about training, um, uh, here I'll take example from from examples from decision trees, okay? If you tell me, okay, I'm training here uh, to a classifier with random forests, with XGBoost, and with light GBM. Um, and if I'm I, tuning the hyperparameters for the three of them, I'll tell you, yeah, okay, is it in principle, like the light GBM and the XGBoost will have better performance then the random forest, okay, this should happen by design, and the difference between those two will be very small, and probably what we call neglectable for the business. So, um, and this will happen as long as, long as you do the upper parameters right, it's very likely that this will happen. So, if you know this by design, perhaps invest your time on more feature engineering, acquisition of extra data, cleaning up our data will be likely to bring you better results then basically trying everything that can work uh, in terms of yet another package, yet another exotic algorithm, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. So here, using theory not to defend the choice, but to prune my hypothesis and to prioritize the work that I need to done in order to improve uh, based on resources that, that, you, that you have. And simple is beautiful. 
Okay, simple is great. Simply, simple models are less likely to overfit. Okay, simple models will be able to resist better to drift. So by keeping their performance stable, where data drift uh, will occur. Simpler models will be easier to maintain in production, okay? Small changes to the code base, which will affect data collection, are likely to have smaller effects on the way your model behaves because you have less inductive variance. And simpler models will also be easier to explain. If they are easier to explain, they are easier to be adopted by business owners, and they are also to be owned by engineers as they, as they are easier to debug. Okay, and every if you think about features that your model is, every feature that your model uses, it will be equivalent of 50 lines of code. Okay, so the larger the code, the most likely it will get buggy in the future, and that's exactly the same thing when it comes to down to, to machine learning models. So make sure that there is a trade-off. There is a delta, significant delta that you use, for instance, when you uh, add one to ten features to your model. Okay, that is sufficient enough, big enough, in order to justify the additional work that you guys will have to maintain it. And these reasons that I just enunciated is why, even today, eighty percent of the model models running in production are simply linear logistic regression ones. Okay because they are easier to maintain. So their life cycle is longer, so companies end up making more money on the long run from them, even if they are uh, less, um, less accurate than other things that you could put there. <clears throat> and now, in order to, to, to illustrate this from, with an example of mine in the past, back on a public listed company, I used to work from the telco business and also transport, a telco applied to transport. We had there um, um, a feature that was being generated based on data from a digital identity manager that will identify you not based on your uh, ID card number, but based on your MAC address, the watch browser you are using. So brings to you a digital entity, a digital fingerprint, that then uses to, to monitor risk that, for instance, that you will try to make some fraud on e-commerce purchase. Yeah? These data source uh, for the company that was providing us the, the API, this was somehow unstable, even if the, the, the feature itself was one of the top five in the model. Okay, So one thing that we decided to do was to see, okay, Try, let's try to drop this. Let's try to drop one of the most powerful features in our model. Um, and what happened there after we dropped it in terms of performance? Can someone try to guess? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. I wished, by the way. I wished that uh, absolutely nothing. All the other features picked up on that space. Um, and we end up staying with a model that was easy to maintain, less one data source, so less costs, uh, direct costs to be paying, and the same performance in the test set, and perhaps somehow, how you said, I saw the, uh, this, somehow a bit better also in, in production. Albeit, I cannot tell if that will directly uh, a cause of that change. Um, and in, I mean, there is something that I would like to, in terms of when it comes to feature selection, especially on uh, spaces of, um, so non-connection is a process to more spaces on tabular data that, that are, will be, will be good for you to use in order to keep models simple, which I mean most of the time to keep either simple approaches or just a few features, uh, uh, crunchy features for the model to be trained on, which is Boruta Sharp. I think Boruta Sharp is a package uh, developed in Python, principal, one of the uh, few principal feature selection packages that exist out of there. It is model agnostic um, and is rooted on st solid statistical principles that uh, now is out there and it's working 
this will be fine for do exactly this automatically crunch your feature space and make it like nice simple to maintain so lesson number six that I got here understand your models okay model debugging is not just some something flashy in the in the wall so so it's not only about see if the training error is uh, way uh, uh, larger or lower than the test error um, you need to really dive deep on this so leave to see business logic you need to be comparing good case bad case you need to be doing unit testing on looking okay what if we have this extreme case here this 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 cast this type of customer so that we expect to be better, expect to be good. So perhaps we can design a sort of unit test to see, okay, what the model responds if it's parsed with the, the, this customer. So um, interpretability. Nowadays, it's absolutely crucial. It's not only enough to deploy uh, models without saying to anybody on your company. So this is not enough. You need to be able to answer why how it works, in which cases, which are the limitations, which is a segment of your business that you can guarantee your performance, and which are the segments that you cannot. Um, you need to be looking to evaluate your model, not only on the entire data that you have, but in segments on it. Okay, Segments can be regions, can be time spans, can be uh, different types of shops, depending on the business that you have. Um, you need to be able to test logically. Some people call it like single versus batch. Sometimes your model, when presented to a series of cases to classify, will present different results than if you ask each one of these cases individually to be acquired by the model. And this happened because your data pipelines are buggy. Okay? So, um, and uncertainty estimation as well. So right now it's not only enough that we say, okay, it's a cat, it's a dog, it's a human. And we say, I'm 97, this is a likelihood, this is a probability, depending on what you are using it to build your classifier, that this photo is, it will be a cat, it will be belong to a dog, will belong to a human, but also to quantify the uncertainty that your model has on giving that answer. One of the problems of the ML models, once they are done, whatever input you give to them, they probably will give you an output, regardless of the knowledge they accumulate on it. Okay, so, and if it is a person, the person will ask you, hmm, yes, no, I don't know, but the model never answers you, I don't know. And this is why you need some audit there to say, okay, it will be a dog, but I'm absolutely not, not sure of that. Okay, so you need to look to uncertainty uh, estimation. And in order to cover all these things, so there are some trends that I would like to, to, to share with you today. One are slicing tools, so tools that will look to the performance of your models on a test set, for instance, and will slide your test set based on that to provide you places where your model is working well and other places on your data your model is not working so that, so well and they're a very good tool very visual that has been developed by uber uh, on the latest year is uber's manifold that i really recommend to you another is conformal prediction conformal prediction is not a tool per se that uh, actually there is a concrete package that I'll back it up and no, take it easy. They didn't, uh, they, they didn't bribe me to be bringing you these packages here today. But uh, the number of packages is MAPI. And conformal prediction will be about quantifying the uncertainty that your models uh, have on providing a certain uh, response. And finally, also Bayesian machine learning, okay? And everything that is constructed around Bayesian machine learning nowadays, uh, we, where you'll be able to constrain your model parameters, constrain your input space, based on inputs from your business experts. Um, and here, there is PyMC3 uh, that is well used on uh, uh, media mix modeling and market mix modeling problems um, that I would like to highlight to you. 
Finally, number seven is trust no one. So if something is too good to be true, uh, probably then it's false. Um, so so um, whoever um, here on the room, I like to ask like yet another question, is that whoever experienced training a model that is as a huge accuracy precision on your test set or on your cross-validation in a very difficult problem. Huge accuracy, very difficult problem on test set, yeah. Was it true? No, right? <laughs> was bullshit, right? So, um, so it, this happens all the time. If it is too good to be true, doubt it. It's probably because uh, something went wrong, okay? Blue screen, if you were in the 90s. So, um, so and I'll give you here an example of this. That not the example with the, sh the house that that with uh, like five bedrooms that cost 80k. Well, in in Berlin that will be even a bigger uh, bigger love, I have to say. But uh, I would like to bring example here from, from from my current company. Okay, so that we had at some point we built uh, internally a model that was claimed to have an accuracy of 90% on all the lanes. All our business, all the lanes, all the sub-business models that we have, all the regions that we have. So um, and this is predicting optimal costs uh, or optimal prices for the loads. After debugging the model, we've discovered that the evaluation test bed was bugged and the so-called accuracy, the regression problem, was actually around 50%. So 90%, 50%, that's a big gap there. Um, and again, also on this ca case, the, the, the remembers the, the plus issue on the phone number that still, still today, I don't know why they didn't fire me on the, on the spot on that day. I guess I was just lucky. Finally, yes, performance is a matter of perspective. This is not true where it comes to the impact on the bottom line, either your model is helping on that or not. But it will matter in several intermediate steps, steps of your product delivery life cycle. Okay? So <laughs> storytelling was and will always be part of the data science toolkit. Okay? So, and the way you look to performance and you share that view to performance with others will influence your path on projects, will later on influence your success or not. I'll give your attention to these two figures here on the, um, on the screen. Left hand side is a clearly area under receiving operator curve type of uh, chart where you see blue and red um, uh, lines correspond to two different models. And if you see there, they are, in terms of performance, they are very, very similar, so, okay? So you can see that in terms of area under curve, one is like 62, 0.62, another is 0 0.59, okay, a bit better, uh, the blue one, but yeah, they seem roughly equivalent. Then we go here to a cumulative, a cumulative accuracy profile in the right, which is not, nothing less than, than the precision curve there. And we'll see that in terms of the percentage of accepted cases, so or the region of thresholds that interest to the business, the performance of Jumal is actually very, very different, which is something around zero to 20%. So in a bank, we'll never accept more than 20, 30% of the, the, the applicant for a loan. So you see the performance between both, which uh, are like depicted by the green line, green uh, line and blue or purple line in the right hand chart are indeed very different. Okay, so uh, this is what matters for your um, for your application, not the left hand chart. Even if the left hand chart is so called industry standard, okay? so please look to different KPIs. Use proxy KPIs on your offline evaluation that will resemble actually the KPIs that then will matter to the business. Understand your business very well, which are the metrics that matter, which evaluation test bed will mimic better real world. And always validate your models on benchmarks close to the market. Okay? Use simulation scenarios, use friends and family tests, 
so generate data synthetically yourself, do A-B tests, and explore the results of the A-B tests with causality frameworks. Here, two trends on that. One is causality with uh, some people call double-edged or orthogonal machine learning, where we estimate which treatment, A or B, uh, is ideal to which example. Okay. So instead of just saying we should use A for all examples, we should use B for all examples. So, um, and this is like, there is this EconML uh, Python package that is very good on that. Um, and sequential A-B testing, so which will allow you not to basically wait until all the uh, examples, um, uh, all the examples on um, your A-B testing go to the end, but will allow you to determine uh, early on, so where, um, where um, when you have a significant uh, result out of your A-B test. Okay, here there is some commercial products, I can tell you offline. Very quickly to wrap up. So these are the eight lessons I just passed to you. So um, that for what I learned uh, throughout my career. Um, about sender, very, very quickly. Logistics, road freight, marketplace, trying to connect large companies with are shippers that want to move containers from A to B to small carriers, which are like typically companies to one driver and one truck up to 10, 15 trucks there. Um, trying to bring digitalization to a very fragmented and um, very fragmented and very uh, old um, industry. Uh, for bring it forward with optimization and automation throughout AI tools. Uh, this is a bit uh, of my team on a, on a team building event very uh, recently. Um, and this is the current setup. So two teams, one more focused on having the data platform team, so pipelines in and out from the data warehouse and material infrastructure that enables analytics weapon and scale in the company where we are 1,100 strong at the moment, and also a machine learning engineering team that is responsible at the moment by creating these automated pricing solutions and microservices that are able to, to automate that part of the business. Um, in the future, we are looking to grow into this setup here, okay, where we'll have a team on just working on A-B testing, two ML teams, and two teams working on analytics and data platform. This is the view that we are, the vision that we also want to make through with these teams, okay, where there is a full business automation from the moment uh, a load, uh, that even searching for loads on the internet or creating loads directly from shippers, up to the assignments of the whole value chain. And then these are the topics we are looking to right now or um, in the upcoming um, in the upcoming year, in terms of data governance, data quality, and automated frameworks also to manage data quality, even driven architectures and data mesh, um, MLOps platformization, um, and cost estimation and load to carrier recommendation in marketplace. Some vacancies. So if you guys are interested about this, just grab me for a coffee. They are good, Ellie told me. And other than that, keep on tracking. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Louis. Um,